helps if you turn on the microphone. <laughs> Good morning. morning. Let's come together with a moment of prayer. We start with these words, O God. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien. That's us these days, Holy One. Aliens, strangers in our own lives, in our own skin trapped in cisterns of despair, some dug by our own hands. Enclosed in the depths of these oh-so-finite spaces, the view is limited. What we see most clearly is what isn't, what doesn't work, what can't happen. Raise us up, Creator God, Lift our eyes to see beyond the can'ts and isn'ts, the don'ts, the won'ts, to notice every glimmer of light, no matter how faint, to see you in all things. Lift our spirits to embrace the barest shreds of hope, the constant companionship of your presence that is ever in and around us, Lift our hearts, break them open. Shatter the hardness and pour in healing grace and love that out of that abundance our mouths may speak. Amen. So to you who have joined in person this God's Day, good morning. morning. And to you who have joined online this God's day. Good morning. We are all together in this space, both by physical presence and by spirit. And just know that God is ever with us, even when we are alone. God is here. Our prayer this morning to to be our opening psalm and song is based on Psalm 105. Let us come together in worship. Give thanks to the God whose name is mercy. Call upon that name and proclaim every good thing that gives you reason to sing. Sing to God, sing praises to the God whose name is mercy, so that you can feel the winds of change stir in your heart. Let your hope crash onto the shores of creation as loudly and boldly as a clanging cymbal. Make noise, make a lot of noise, because you dare to believe in freedom and justice. You believe in peace and love, you believe in the God whose name is mercy. Praise God's name. Amen. Like Christ, we come alone. We come full of grief and despair. We come battered and overcome by all that weighs against us. We come to confess that we don't have all the answers, but long to hear the wisdom from someone or something other than ourselves. In the silence that we now share.
We want to be where you are, Jesus. But we also want to be safe and comfortable and right. We want to be where you are, but we also want to be with our friends and to be respected by others. We want to be where you are, but we also feel as if we don't know enough or aren't good enough. We want to be where you are, but we also don't want to make anyone else uncomfortable. We want to be where you are, but we also aren't sure the time is right. We want to be where you are, but we also see the storm raging and, well, we want to be where you are, Jesus. Today, make that our overriding desire and give us courage to step out where you are. Amen. Friends, feel the wind, the winds of grace that sweep over creation and over our heads. There is music there too, over your head, reminding you again that there must be a God somewhere. Everyone who calls upon the name of the God whose name is mercy will be saved. You are forgiven. You are so loved. Amen. Today's Gospel reading is from Matthew, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 36. Jesus walks on the water to meet his disciples and calm a storm. This passage was actually one of the passages that was used as part of day camp this year. Um, And it was used to illustrate the shield of faith. Uh, Sherry Meyerveen actually led that particular day, um, but, uh, but the kids definitely appreciated the whole concept of the shield of faith that, that protects us and is with us, that we can carry with us. But here is this morning's gospel reading. Immediately after the multitude was fed, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking towards them, on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, Command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind that appropriately picks up right now, he became frightened. And beginning... And began to sink, or beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand, caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, 
Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Appropriately, again. <laughs> and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret. After the people of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word throughout the region and brought all who were sick to him and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Merciful God, your word is written on our hearts. Your word permeates our very selves. Help us to truly take strength from your word and help us to constantly work to discern the direction that your wind is blowing us. In your name we pray, amen. So I grew up canoeing with my family. It was great fun getting out on the water, um, two canoes for the family, my mom and I in one with the dogs, and uh, my dad and my sisters in the other canoe. And we would go about, and, but in the last five years, I have learned to switch to a kayak instead, simply because those are the boats that are currently available to me. And yes, I can see Pat, you're, you're nodding. <laughs> So, so the two boats that were available were a nice, long, sleek, 17-foot, just, it, it would move. But that's not the one that I learned to kayak on. I got the 10-foot round, well, I call it the waddler. It didn't move very much at all. Now, the good thing about that particular little boat was it was fairly stable. I mean, it, it, it just it wouldn't move at all in any direction. Of course, um, you know, if, if I leaned too far, well, not even all that far, it, it, it could actually topple over fairly easily. It had very good what's called primary stability, but not secondary stability. So I never really tested, just like in the canoe, we didn't, rock that canoe very much. I didn't rock this particular kayak at all. And just, I didn't want to get dumped out into the water. Well, this summer, I graduated to a longer kayak. It's 14 feet long. It's as wide as the 17 footer. So while it looks uh, rounder, it's not actually. That's, that's just an optical illusion, really. And it can actually keep up with the 17 footer. It does not wallow in place. When I sit in this particular kayak, I'm much more in contact with the sides of the boat, with everything. It, it fits me like a giant shoe. I like it a lot, if you can tell. Of course, the primary stability is vastly reduced, which means that it leans a lot more easily from side to side without tipping over. In other words, this boat rocks. <laughs> now, the first time that I took this boat out, we paddled into the middle of the lake, and my paddle partner says to me, now, lean from side to side. Lean that boat side to side and feel what happens. Logically, I knew that this boat had much better secondary stability, whatever that means. And I had also witnessed my partner's boat doing just this maneuver. You know, he, he basically can almost get to a 45 degree angle with the water. And for someone who grew up with canoes, the idea of tipping the boat that much is frankly terrifying. You don't rock the boat. So I, I confess, I leaned my new boat a tiny little bit and chickened out long before that secondary stability had a chance to kick in and stop the boat from dumping me into the water. I just, I couldn't take that risk. I didn't have faith in the physics. Like Peter though, 
when his faith flagged on the lake and Jesus gently chided him and lifted him up, my paddling companion said to me, did you have a chance to feel the boat stop you? You will get to the point where you're comfortable with the stability. It's there. Don't worry. Don't doubt it. This boat is much more stable than your old one. Now that was a bit of an eye opener. See, I had always felt mired in place in the old boat, unable to move in any direction, including falling out. So with the new kayak being much more stable and actually able to move across the water, that was amazing. In fact, this new kayak worked better when I learned to lean into my strokes. It moved faster when I learned to rock the boat. So what held me back? It was fear. It was fear that if I rocked the boat too much, I might tip over. Fear that if I rocked the boat, I might be in water over my head. Well, not very much fear about that one, really. I can swim, and you wear life vests when you're on the water, after all. So mostly the fear was fear of inconvenience. If I fell out of the boat, I would be in for a really awkward time of it trying to set things to right. If you don't rock the boat, you can't be inconvenienced. But is that something really to be afraid of? It's actually really more of a strong aversion to being inconvenienced. It's not exactly a fear, but it is just as paralyzing. An aversion to risking inconvenience saps energy, and it drains lifeblood both from individuals and from communities. And it anchors your boat so that you cannot move in any direction. I've long found it very curious that boats are used, boats of a variety of sizes and shapes are used as a metaphor for the life of faith both individual and corporate. We're all in a boat together. See, a boat works best when it's the right size and shape for the waterway that you're trying to use it on, right? Yes. <laughs> and while there are such things as ocean kayaks, if you want to get across the ocean, you might want to use a bigger vehicle. Now, it's not to say that you can't get across the ocean by paddling. People have done it after all. It's not the most efficient. And you really need to have a good vision and a good plan for how you're going to do it. But typically speaking, a larger ship is generally recommended. Now, another curious part of the analogy is that boats work best when both the steering mechanism and the power supply, whether it's wind or motor or paddle, work, to work together to direct the vessel. If the tack is up the wrong heading to the keel, you'll just spin in place. Well, you'll spin in place at best, and at worst, you'll become torn apart in a storm. When the heading and the energy of the boat are at odds, nothing works. The wind blows a certain way. And the steering has to respond to that. And the power needs to back up the steering in order for the boat to move. Actually, it reminds me of one of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. In one of these movies, the ship is, is, sorry. The ship is becalmed and they're stuck. One member realizes that if they can just get the ship racking. They'll be able to start moving again. So he pretends to see something on one side of the boat. And so when everyone runs to port, he then runs over to starboard and back and forth and back and forth. Eventually the company catches on and they consciously decide to trust the inspiration that started that movement and they all rock the boat together. 
by working together, even though they have different motivations and goals, they're able to get the ship moving again, which means that they are able to live, and then they can work towards their disparate objectives. Sorry, it keeps feeding back, which is why I keep putting my hand up. So rocking the boat, or even as Peter did, getting out on the water, these are not bad things, but they can be scary. When the boat is already rocking because of raging storms and you're unable to control the boat, the loss of control amplifies the terror of the storm. And this is where Jesus meets us, at that storm. Jesus meets us at the point where the storm is out of control, the boat is mired and wallowing, and you fear it may be taking on water. And the whole company is a little bit green about the gills. Jesus encourages us to step out where we are uncertain of our footing, to trust that our feet will be secure. Jesus shows us how to listen to the wind and waves that we may discern our heading. Trust in Jesus calms the raging storm and allows us to stop doom scrolling through news headlines. And it gives us focus for our purpose. Jesus shows us how to rock the boat in order to stay afloat and moving forward. Let us pray. Merciful God, the storms are raging all around us. We know that you are out there, but with so much wind and rain, and foggy clouds all about, we have a hard time seeing you. Clear our vision, O oh God, that we may discern even the shadow of your presence in the storm. Help us to take our heading and direction from you. Amen. Affirmation of faith is a canticle called The Mystery of Our Religion. Christ Jesus our Lord was revealed in flesh and was vindicated in the spirit. He was seen by angels and proclaimed among the nations. He was believed in throughout the world and was taken up in glory. He will be revealed in due time by God, the blessed and only ruler, the sovereign Lord of all, who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, and whom alone be honor and might forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to go grab the prayer list from the back. I'll be right back. Are there any other prayer requests? Shut up. Shut up. Let us pray. This first prayer is called A Prayer for Beirut by Maran C. Tirabasi. Holy One of mercy and peace, as you walked across the stormy sea so long ago, walk in the rubble of your great city, Beirut. Hold tenderly. <coughs> mm. 
Hold tenderly all who mourn this day, loved ones who have died, and those who are waiting for identifications. and for those who are missing to be found. Be among those who care for the wounded and those who try to cope with this catastrophe in the midst of the struggle ongoing with COVID-19. In the chaos of broken buildings, and the aftermath of the terrible rain of glass <coughs> give moments of hope and welcome kindness of neighbors and the generosity of the world. To the reconstruction of the city itself, bring courage and to the equally long reconstruction of the confidence of people so destabilized, bring peace. For we pray in all your holy names. Amen. Uh, Merciful God, who hears our cries and our joys, we lift up these additional concerns to you. for all who are in need of healing. Bob Price, Linda Briggs, Amy Rudolph, Emily Adams, Joanna Price Rusk, Heal your children, O oh God. For those who are disabled by injury or illness, uh. for our shut ins. For all who are troubled by confusion or burdened by pain. For students and teachers who have returned to school around the country. For the family of Maureen Campbell For Jean Cooper, who passed away on the 6th, and for all of his family and friends who love him and miss him dearly. who are about to undergo surgery, including Bob Price and Linda Briggs. For all whose increasing years bring weariness, for all who cannot sleep, for all who practice the healing arts, we pray to you, O oh God, be our helper and protector. Save the afflicted, have mercy on the lowly, raise up the fallen, help the needy, 
humble the proud, return the lost, feed the hungry, release the captive, heal the sick, revive the weak, and comfort those who fear. All this we ask for the sake of the world you love and in the name of the one you sent to save us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Part of worship is offering ourselves to God in whatever form that needs to take, whether it is by the offering of money, the gifts and donations that you make to the churches and charities that you support, whether it is by the work of your hands, building fences to protect children, making masks to protect each other, painting to make spaces beautiful, and so many other ways of giving and offering. As I read this next prayer poem, I would like you to reflect on your own reasons for why you want to give. This is a poem called Choosing Presence by Connie Tuttle, Reverend Connie Tuttle. Solitude creates space to encounter God in dew-touched leaves that shimmer in the morning sun, in frosty breath scattering wordless songs into the world, in canyon echoes calling to the past in a tender caress, easing an unknown ache emptying and filling by turn. Isolation firmly closes the door on the sacred, muddying our thoughts, thrusting its finger into open wounds, clouding vision with wordless fear, finding only liquid breath beneath engorged waves, sounds muffled by the relentless pounding of a thrashing heart, broken by a bruising grip, modeling both skin and soul. In these lonely times, choose solitude. Choose it with an open heart Invite God to tea, be present in each day to the gift of every moment, to the awareness of possibilities. Hold your life gently so that solitude does not morph into isolation that buries hope, distorts vision, contorts reality but rather enter deeply into the delight of creation, the wonder of life, the gift of unexplored vistas. As we conclude today, we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our creator in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May God be with you until we meet again. May loving counsels guide and uphold you. May a shepherd's care enfold you. God be with you.
until we meet again.